This is PodKit, episode 46, Triclops, on Monday, February 18th, 2019. And now, half a decade ago. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk46. Hey. Hello. How's it going? Happy Monday. It is. Wow, look at that. Did it snow How did today? That uh it's been uh it snowed yesterday. Just oh, a little bit. It's, been, oh, it's only been one day since it snowed. It's gonna snow a bunch on Wednesday. I know, Perfect. I'm not going anywhere again. It's awful. It'll be I th- I think I'll work from home, but that'll be my sixth time working from home in four weeks. Yeah, I know. It's it feels really terrible, doesn't it? It's it's certainly interesting. It mixes know, it up. I, it mixes it up, but I feel so bad. Like I I basically didn't go in for a week. Yeah, but we're uh, we're spending less on gas. We're spending true. less time in our cars. That's that's also true because I um I was at the office a couple of weeks ago and then I came home through that one snowstorm that we had, and it yeah. took about two hours and forty five minutes to get back home to St. Paul. What? Yeah. Yikes. So 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 after that, I thought you know. I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I'm done at an hour and a half. It took me an hour and a half to get to work a couple Wednesdays ago because there was, there were like 12 fire trucks blocking oh, Lake sure. Street. Mm-hmm. And yes. so it took me an hour to go, a mile and a half. And then the rest was fine because it was, you know, 930 by the time I got through it. So I got to work at 10. Yeah. I left my apartment at like 815. Yep. That's it. it sp- spending that much time in the car um, is terrible, so I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, yeah. agreed. It's a good way to get through some podcasts, though. Oh, sure. I cut through almost four hours of podcasts at double speed. It was fantastic. Well, For you real. know, and I got through so many. I was at last February's podcast level, and now I got to April, <laughs> uh, I got to August. Oh wow, August! Yeah. Yeah. That's six months of podcasts. Yeah, in, in podcasts. two and a half hours, I listened at six x. <laughs> <laughs> there you go yeah you, i always used to put on like full albums when i used to have a three-hour commute on those awful snow days yeah uh into vu yep. I used to, it was like well i guess i'll just listen to the complete discography of the white stripes why not why not why not yep Let's see what jack white's up to still playing guitar as always well, uh, we have some follow up this time around, or I guess follow up in some ways, but uh, more than anything, I think we just like to shout out uh, to a listener who gave us some cool uh, feedback uh, last week. Uh, so, David Bruitt, if you're out there, um, I I know uh, you know it's awesome to to know that you're a friend friend of the show. I know we've run into one another a couple times at various meetups and JSMN and things um thanks thanks for listening yeah i don't quite remember what he was replying to uh from our last episode uh, um david said uh, he didn't know about the animation uh limitation with css grid however we found out um like literally hours after recording last podcast that there's a a spec out there and i think firefox canary or beta maybe even canon now supports animating css grids so it's coming so hey nice super cool and then yeah, i think he was also commenting on some of the um like the work life balance stuff that we talked about from last time as well yep uh, that's always good uh, always always should try to balance your life and work this is true yep so uh brian i hear that you've been uh hooked using hooks. some hooks oh i've been hooked on hooks that's for sure hooked on hooks oh boy tell me more so, uh, what was it? Last Thursday, hooks were released, or two weeks ago, Thursday? Something yeah, like that. Some, something like that. And boy, what a release! So that day, I dove in deep and was implementing some change detection to refetch data on a server server paged table. So I'm like, you know, I'm gonna do it with hooks. I uh, so I added some use state, and it was great, super easy. It was like 17 fewer lines in a file that was maybe. 75 lines to begin with 80 lines something like that and so some of it was just removing typescript types because they're inferred based on the initial value now 
And so you don't have to do like an interface of your, your component state and just, you know, removing the like semicolon or squiggly braces and whatnot that comes with a class component. So that was super nice. So less code. Um, let's see. Then the next day I started using use effect to do some change detection when props change to refetch data that use those props as parameters for the API call. So things like dates, you know, if someone changes a date outside of this component, we need to fetch the data again. Um, so I did that. It was in a component. It was great. I was loving hooks. I tried to unit test it a bit. It was kind of rocky. Um, React has the uh, or a new uh, function that you call with a callback where you perform some state change or effects stuff on a React hook component. Um, and then React will, in this act callback, kind of flush it out synchronously and basically lets you um, do things to a component that is being tested in the same way that React would when you render it to a DOM. So it makes sure that your you know call things are in order and you don't have any weird races or things that aren't called when they are in the browser or vice versa. Nice. Um, so I played around with that a little bit, ended up using React testing library and got some stuff working with, um, basically instead of, so actually I'll rewind a little bit. So I did this pagination stuff in one page or one table component. It was good. I didn't quite unit test that hooks. We had enough coverage on the app to deploy it. So it was fine. Um, then our, we had another story that we pulled in that was for baking another server page table. So, hmm, this sounds like a good time to play around with a custom hook because this this uh, hook was doing things that managed, like, what's your current page, which, what's the page size, and it returned helper functions that went to a table component for things like on page change, on page size change. And it would recompute which page you're on um, based on all that, and then it would it would call a function that I passed in, which just returned a promise with some data of a particular structure. So we can basically have one hook that um, does all of that common stuff for every page table. That's cool. Super slick. It just kind of like, I just copied it from one, put it in a hook and then copied that hook call to the other uh, component and updated some of the the things that were different about them. And it just worked. It was awesome. Cause I'm like, this just saved like 60 lines of code between a component that where it's doing the same thing. And then we can just have one implementation and aggressively unit test that and, th- and know it'll be fine for every use. Um, and it, it was great. And then I started testing it and it was a little more rocky. Um, I have some um, links in the show notes about a big thread on the react GitHub page. And then, um, a repository by the user 3.1 or uh, what's his name? Uh, Sunil Pai, who um, I think he's the one who committed that act function to react. He's been kind of the react testing hooks kind of guy in the GitHub and maybe on Twitter too. I don't follow him there, but anyway, so how I unit tested this custom hook that calls a fetch. So basically this comes around with, um, if you call a promise or something, and then you have a you know dot then function that does something with that data when it comes back. So in our case, um, this hook calls a bunch of state setters once the data comes back. So it's setting like the new um, data array is this. It's setting loading to be false. Um, in some cases, it sets a page size and things if it was re like initializing to a default value. And that isn't wrapped in act. So react will th- throw an error in your console saying your state mutations are not uh, being wrapped in act in a testing environment. This is bad and can you, or you could be missing bugs that are present in your code. So to, to fix this for my hook, um, there is less documentation out there than there is today. Um, I ended up, mocking a function so um one of the parameters to my custom hook is just a promise that resolves data and so instead of using an actual promise like just dot uh function and then doc 
uh, resolve value or something like that. Yeah. I had a, a mock function that was a function that returned an object with the property then, which uh, was another jest function, which who uh, which had an implementation of uh, getting a callback passed to it. And then um, in the body of that callback, it would um, call act and then call that callback. So basically mocking out how a uh, resolved promise kind of works, but then uh-huh. wrapping that callback in act. So it's kind of gross. It's not actually a promise. Um, I'd like to dig into it a little more in the future and use, uh, I think Jest can use fake timers and then you can kind of wrap timer.tick with your act function. Mm. And that might work. I'm not really sure. So there's another repository of that Sunil made that has tons of examples and some explanations. Um, I th- I've uh, Dan commented on this other thread that I linked about um, async await not quite being supported yet. So we will have to see what happens. It's new, so I can't say this is surprising in any way, but it's super fun to get working. Um, way less code. It's a whole different way of thinking about it. And I think it's pretty awesome. Cool. Right on. Yeah, I, uh, I've, I haven't tested anything with hooks, even though I've been writing hooks. I don't usually do component-level testing, so that's why I didn't run into it, really. Um, you know, if you're ever bored, you should consider making, like, a little, like, uh, lightning talk for this kind of thing, because I'd love to try it. I just don't know how. For unit testing hooks? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Hmm. You should uh, you should shop it around to React Amend, too, or React Minneapolis. Yeah, there you go. I feel like that'd be a, a little better place to give a talk, but... Both, or do both, both. places are fine. We, yeah. They both are JavaScript. And don't let True. them tell you it's not. Yeah, well, that, that would be fun to tr- play around with. Then I can think of some more. I could find some more uh, simple examples that are more pure and not tied to what I do at work. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's always fun. Yep. So that's hooks. I totally recommend playing around with it. Um, React testing library is pretty nice. It's a bit different than Enzyme. Um, if you do a Enzyme mount on a component, it will not even run any hooks, and a shallow, especially not. Um, where React Testing Library, you know, you just render the whole thing. So it's using React's renderer underneath. So things just kind of work how they do in a browser because it is the same library. Right on. Yeah, you're reminding me I really need to check out the uh, Front End Masters uh, uh, React Testing course because uh, it's taught by KCD. So uh, well, yeah. the, the it's funny you mentioned who- that. We should uh, we should talk over at the uh, end of the show later <laughs> about about front of masters or KCD. Yeah, that one. <laughs> good old Kent C. Dodds. Yeah, our good friend. Um, yeah, no hooks are great. Uh, Zach at work, he's been um, he's been busy for the last couple of weeks, but um, about three weeks ago now, he uh, like right basically a week before the hooks went live, you know, out of alpha, um, he had just played with it in a little play- playground and you know at first he wasn't convinced so, like the day before i come back the next day and he's like whoa do, do you know what just happened hooks <laughs> oh that was that was my feeling exactly i w- i couldn't stop talking about it with some of my teammates yep. um i've i've given a demo of this custom hook to at least three people outside of my team um, nice i think i'm the first person in my company to ship hooks in production oh most certainly yeah at least at the time of when I checked, which is early last week, I was the only one who had it even on our enterprise GitHub. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know, I, which, I which may them. may be good, maybe not. It, no, 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 it's good. It's good. Um, we've been doing a little training course for some new team members at Doherty. And, um, one of the things that I wanted to put in the curriculum, but we just didn't have time to do was like, let's just spend a few hours on hooks because, even though they're going to jump into code like in the next few weeks where there won't be hooks in three months when somebody's, you know, at a client like, Hey, you want to use hooks? And they'd be, they're going to say, I have no idea what that is. But if we had ahead time to put that into the curriculum, we would have, and that would have been a really fun thing for them to be able to say, yeah, we, we know what those are. You could also be super bleeding edge and only teach them hooks. And Uh, that's what I would have done. If I had been, (laughs) if I had had a choice, that's what I would have done. There are no classes. 
that's what I might have said during the JavaScript regular introduction section. Yeah. Yeah, I might have yeah. might have had a few too heavy opinions during that section. Hey, but that's, that's okay. Right. That's what I do. That's what we do here, right? That's what Twitter's that's for. True. That's what Twitter is all about. Yeah, heavy opinions all the time. I I uh, started to write up a pitch for a mini bar talk that was like, uh, you might not need semicolons and other bad opinions I have. Um, you should just rant about how awesome classes are and how well they be, and how well they compile down to ES five. Well, and then you should, you should you should insist that inheritance is the solution to everything, uh, and that tree yeah. shaking is terrible, and classes don't need to support it. I'll, yeah. I'll just I'll just like collapse on stage afterward, and people will be like, "What's wrong?" <laughs> you should talk about how a single bundle for your entire single page application is great. I mean, that's literally what React Native is. So, <laughs> well, I, uh, and then I was thinking, well, that's what you need on the server side. Yeah. Right. Yep. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Everything. Um, everything just, is the same thing except for when it's different. Exactly. And just just take a step back from that before we continue. Just imagine that this one language, even though we can basically maul it to do to be whatever shape we want, can literally do anything. It can be yeah. an a, a a mobile app internals driver it can be a web app delivery mechanism it can be a web app builder it can be a server side who knows what i mean it, it's amazing in how flexible this thing is it's pretty wild and it runs in the cloud tell that to someone 10 years ago truly <laughs> cloud native well just about just about 10 years ago that would have been okay i saw a thing on twitter today that um Node.js was started almost exactly 10 years ago today. Yep. Happy birthday, Node. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Node, let's talk about TypeScript. <laughs> let's talk about TypeScript. Um, so I've been um, doing some stuff, uh, and I've needed to code some code. And I picked TypeScript because uh, all of the things I do now are pretty much in TypeScript, um, mm-hmm. except the things that are legacy and I didn't convert yet. Um, so this is a little um, like deterministic API for doing some, you know, like interview quizzes and stuff. Yeah. So basically the idea is the data is always the same if you give it the same input, but yeah. it, it's all generated. So if you give it input one, two, three, four, five, six, you get something. And if you do one, two, three, four, five, seven, you'll get something else. But if as long as you keep repeating those requests, you'll still get the same stuff. It's all deterministic. It's super cool. Um, the other thing I'll note about this code is that I'm using um, Zite now. Is that is that how you say it? Yeah, Zite? good old now. Yeah, now, yeah. So now is really cool. Um, you might have heard about serverless, uh, and this API that I wrote is serverless, which means that there's no server. Maybe sometimes that's not it's actually not, what it's it not means. It's not your server. It, it but it's, that EC2 server is also not my server, so I'm not sure. That's true. That argument doesn't make sense to me. It's not your responsibility, but yeah, yeah okay, sure. Um, so that's really cool. And I've been using TS Node to do all of this. And one of my favorite things about TS Node is that it really works just like you would hope it does. You don't need a like transpiling step. You don't need to do any additional like TSC checks or anything. I mean, you could if you want to, but you don't have to. You don't aim, you don't have to compile it out. To JavaScript, and I found the performance to be just fine for everything that I've been doing so far. Um, also, I've, TypeScript. TypeScript, yeah, you know, you know how I feel about that. Love it. Um, I I've used TS Node just a touch for just some like tooling around testing and things, just trying to get some TypeScript to work uh, quite a while ago. Uh, didn't really go down that path too far, but um, seems pretty like a like a good library for server side things that are TypeScript. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's a there's a framework that I've mentioned here on this show before, which is Nest.js, and it's also TypeScript based. They yeah. use TS Node, um, but they also have the capability to export the build as just regular JavaScript, which I always think is really interesting. Um, maybe the idea is like, well, maybe we don't want to pull in a whole different. Like, I don't know what TS Node does internally, so right. Maybe it's a really big dependency, and I and I don't know, but. Uh, I always think that's interesting when you could build but you don't build. Totally. I would assume TS Node just runs everything through TypeScript and then passes the output to 
node. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the other thing that would be interesting, and I, um, I think you, 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 Brian, ran into something where there was a a bug on a package where it couldn't work through the Babel transpiler, but it would work through the yeah. other one. Yeah, ArxJS six point four point zero. Yeah, I wonder if TypeScript or TS Node would freak out on that particular. What does issue. TS Node use for its compiler? No idea. I know it's been around for a while, so I would assume actual the actual TypeScript compiler. Yeah, I uh, uh, where yeah. Babel, Babel TypeScript uh, or whatever that transform plugin is called um, was only released with Babel seven point one or seven 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 zero, I think. So you know, a few months ago, six months ago, or something. Um. On the topic of Babel and Node, and you might mention TypeScript compiler command line things. Um, in Create React app, if you use TypeScript, it's great. It does type. You use the actual TypeScript package and your like IDE to do type checking of your mm-hmm. file as you type. Um, the app will fail to compile due to type errors, and then your unit, but your unit tests, all your spec files aren't covered by the compiler, which for running your app as a, like a dev server makes sense. But when you want to, or I guess in a more classic setup of using actual TypeScript with Webpack and something like TS Loader or Awesome TypeScript Loader, it would also run all of your test files. And so um, we can do things like refactor something or change a type, I guess that wouldn't be a refactor, change a type around and fix all the runtime things and any test that we think it affects. But if we missed a test or something, it will never fail the test suite because there's a type that's wrong. Mm. And so I basically just run TSC every so often just to make sure I don't have any random tests that are suddenly failing because they changed something and didn't realize it affects it. How, how slow is TSC? I think it's pretty quick. Um, it, I, I guess yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to compare it to like uh certain units of like Babel compilation but like on an, my app at work has maybe 4700 lines of code right now and that's including unit tests all the spec files which is i think more code than the actual app uh-huh um at least in terms of number of lines and it takes i don't know two to five seconds to run tsc on the whole thing we're probably closer to five yeah it's because the reason i ask is because maybe that's a candidate for doing like a commit hook so like when you try to commit, it runs it, and it will fail to commit if it doesn't get a oh, clean, totally. clean result. Yeah, I do I, that on all of my stuff. Yep. I do that with with Husky for um, uh, Prettier, but I also like to run it with TSLint, soon ESLint. Um, what else do I use? StyleLint, TSC. Yeah, so that's just yeah. a lot of stuff to run on Hook, and it's it's difficult to run... Um, only on changed files, so I can't do like lint staged for everything because um, I found TS lint errors a run if you only run it on changed files and it doesn't include things like so if you didn't commit the definition of some type or something, TS lint would fail because it couldn't find something. Well, that's actually, why you're not what, running actually, it on just changed files. Got to run it yeah. on everything. True, but then like, what if you commit? What if you have something and uh, you unstage it from commit because it's not ready and it has errors, but you want to commit some other stuff that happens sometimes, which is probably terrible practice, but that was a case where we were having problems. And then just differences between Mac OS and windows. And it was just causing tons of problems to do that. So I removed TS lint from our hook, but that's okay. ES lint will be better in short order. Oh yeah. I can't wait to use it again. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I could tell you about my flight experience very briefly because we've sure. got we've got actually interesting things to talk about. Um, so I tried to fly to Paris the other day; it didn't work. Uh, that's the that's the brief recap. Um, no. So so basically, there was uh, some what do you call it uh, mechanical issue with some flight upstream from my flight which caused the crew from my flight to be late to wherever they were supposed to show up to fly my flight to MSP, which caused a rippling of lateness. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. So the lesson is uh, connections are bad. Don't do that. Uh, the other interesting story that comes out of this is a story about planes. Now, I know the two of you love planes. Planes are great. Planes. They're awesome. 
uh, I don't know anything about planes. Well, I guess the I didn't know anything of last week about planes. But on my little ticket or my boarding pass, you know, it says the name of the type of plane that you're taking on your flight. That's cool. Um, and I guess it was like an Embraer. Like, yes. I, I don't know anything about planes. And so Those I are my thought, favorite. I thought I should Google what an Embraer is because that's a weird name. It's not like a Boeing or a Airbus. It's an Embraer. Yep. So I Google and I just go to Wikipedia and it's just like, okay, cool. It's plane. Uh, it you can look up how many are in service right now, and there's quite a few, and you know it's great, cool. So then a few days later, I'm at home and I'm just looking at YouTube, and suddenly I start seeing all these plane videos, like <laughs> learn about the Boeing four seven seven and the Airbus three hundred and twenty. Wendover Productions videos? No, 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 great. just dozens and dozens of suggested videos about planes. I've never looked at a plane video before in my life, but because of this one search I did one time, yep. I am now forever going to have plane recommendation videos on YouTube. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's YouTube's not a bad thing. Like, this dude <laughs> loves planes, man. I'm just going <laughs> to give him all the plane videos. More planes. Ryan can't get enough of planes. No. So, oh, man. so now that I have, it's like it's not like I didn't want to learn about planes, sure. but it's it's funny because I've never had an interest. But now I've been watching all these videos about what pilots do in the cockpit and what they have in their bags and how they do their spot checks on the planes and pretty all this fancy. stuff. It's pretty fancy and it's pretty fun. And I'm like, wow, this man Google got me here. <laughs> so uh, let me guess, it was an ERJ one seventy five. I don't have my boarding pass with me, but something like that. That seems familiar. That's, that's all right. Those are like my favorite planes in the universe because they're all brand new, um, which goes goes both ways. What's that good, model again? I got to look it up. Uh, the Embraer 175, E-175. Yeah, that sounds right. I think I misspoke earlier and called it an ERJ-175, um, but that's because there's uh, another of my favorite planes is the CRJ, the Canada Air Regional Jet. Uh, and those things are, they're basically tiny reconditioned business jets. And like, you can tell that they're reconditioned business jets because they look like it. Um, and also they only seat like 20 people. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Well, I thought it was really Um, interesting when I was reading about the Embraers, like the, the, there's like three different types that, um, like that exist or something. And like the sizes are... 50 seats, 70 seats, and 76 seats or something. And I thought, yep. what a weird distribution. 50, okay, fine. I guess it's a small flight. 70, okay, it's a little bit bigger, but not too much bigger. But 76, well, that's that's a huge bump up, right? Right. Let there me, must uh, be a range thing, too, or something. That's probably. exactly what I was going to say. The 76 seat one is probably way bigger because it's meant to carry you across country as opposed to, like, from yeah. Minneapolis MSP to Chicago. To Chicago. Yep. Yeah, exactly. The uh, the longest flight I've ever been on within uh, Ember E-175 is, uh, I think it was like Seattle to Minneapolis, which is like four hours. Usually they don't put you on those for more than four or five hours because they can get kind of uh, a little cramped. But uh, maybe I love maybe them. that was okay. Yeah, I, I love them because they're like, they're just these really awesome futuristic tiny jets that yeah. are just really good, really good at being good planes. It wasn't They're too good bad. It, it's a nice but, little, nice little plane. Sometimes you gotta like the, the old pr- propeller airplanes <laughs> that have you know, two rows of seats on each side. Oh man, the Bombardier Dash Eights. Yeah, you yeah, bet. Yeah, I I flew one of those from Latvia into Ukraine, and that yes. was an interesting interesting experience because. I knew, or no one around me was speaking English. Uh-huh. They all, like, you know, I just felt so alien. Like I was in such a foreign environment. It was very interesting. They had some information in English, but it was mostly in <laughs> Latvian, Russian, some English, maybe even a fourth language. Nice. Oh, man. Do you remember out of curiosity whether it was the, like, a uh, Russian knockoff of the Dash Eight. Because... I don't know. So it, it was it was um, Air Latvia Air. Yeah, it was the Latvian like airline. So yeah, my guess is probably not. Yeah, that's fair because it's all EU and stuff. But yeah, 
th- there was this big thing in like the 90s where like Tupolev, the Russian like uh, Boeing basically made a bunch of stuff that was like they had a, they had a knockoff Concorde. They had a knockoff like gigantic passenger jet that was kind of like a 747. Um, and I feel like they had a knockoff Dash 8 too, which is like the prop, the prop planes. Hmm. And those, I just, it's like a, a goal to fly on one of those at some point. Um, I don't have much time, but it would be so fun. <laughs> yeah, that'd be interesting. When I was riding back on the plane from Ord to MSP, yep. I, sat, I sat next to a nice guy um, who does security audits for facilities and buildings and campuses and stuff. Nice. And I don't know where he had just been. It was some, like some kind of chemical plant or something. And then he was flying to MSP to go up to Brainerd to do an audit for a school district. And I thought that was kind of cool. Really yeah. nice guy. That's that's uh, a profession I hadn't thought about before. Yeah, it's cool. apparently it's a big deal. Um, and then he had said that he had done some for airports recently and it was terrible. So that didn't yeah. make me feel very confident about what I had just done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, well. So much for that. What can you do? Watch out for planes. Watch out for planes, indeed, because yeah. they're good. Pra- they're good planes. <sighs> Let's see. Um, I have some. I have some iOS related news. Uh, so uh, Felix Krauss, uh, the person who created um, this awesome uh, toolkit for working with, uh, particularly Apple's developer like developer tool chain and like code signing systems and stuff, uh, called Fastlane. Uh, he's he's been with it for years and years and years, um, clearly since he was the one who created it. Uh, he's leaving he's leaving Google and he's leaving Fastlane, um, which is like super. I well I guess I'm I'm not super embedded in the Fastlane community, but for me it it, it seemed like kind of a um, uh, impactful event because uh, as for as long as I can remember, like you see Felix's name across, uh, you know, Fastlane commits from the beginning to to now, and he's kind of a vocal and um, uh, impactful member of the community there. Um, so uh, it sounds like he's leaving Google to to go pursue things that aren't Fastlane, and uh, more power to him because I, I think if if you've used Fastlane, you know just kind of how much time that saves you and how many headaches it saves you by letting um, kind of uh, the, this really solid um, set of tools for working with things like um, code signing, uh, code signing identities, um, provisioning profiles and stuff, all those arcane things. If you've ever tried to do it on your own, you know, it can be really kind of just horrendous if you don't know what you're doing. And even if you do know what you're doing, um, he's really contributed something great to the community there. So just wanted sure. to give just wanted to give him a shout out and uh, wish him wish him well on his uh, time off. Definitely well deserved. Yeah, it's always good to you know bring something to a really good successful level and step away. It's it's always it's always a fair thing to do. Absolutely. I haven't used Fastlane myself, um, but I does does Expo use it internally? I feel like they might. I think they do. And yeah. I think, you know, they have these like notions of release channels and Expo Expo has all this stuff around managing code signing automatically too. Yeah. And while I'm I'm sure that like you know, they might have considered writing their own, um, all the fast lane stuff is open source as far as I know. Yeah. Um and I'm and, sure I've seen it in the logs. So that's why I wonder. Oh. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. If you if you see it in the logs then they then uh suspicion confirmed because uh you know, Fastlane definitely is the state of the art for it. Like they'll even they even have tools for generating screenshots automatically, nice. um, which is magnificent. Um, they've really done a lot of really great work um, that makes being an iOS developer way easier. They, you need all the help you can get. Absolutely. Well, uh, I heard some rumors, uh, but I don't really know what they mean. Ryan, can you tell me what's up? Oh, I sure can. Uh, New Max. Oh, oh my gosh, Hooray. this is this is gonna be so good. So. Our good friend Kuo from some analyst place in China has spilled the beans again because this is what he does about not only what we knew was coming, but what we didn't know was coming. So we have to get out of the way first. The Mac Pro is still on the table for this year. 
he thinks it'll come, which is good because it should. That's what we were promised. But you never know with Apple these days. You never know. Mac Pro later, later, like towards the end of the year, I bet. That yeah, seems to be y- the thing. I wouldn't be surprised if they did um, talk about it though at WWDC because, and why not? Like, even if it's not, like, launching for retail services in six months, it's not like anybody is going to suffer over um, a demand drought. Not like an iPhone, like, being told about six months in advance. It's a right. niche product, to say the least. Yeah. Um, the fine folks at the Upgrade podcast were... Uh, they They were forecasting that the... I'm a uh, new monitor would be released this summer nice. and maybe a new MacBook Pro this summer and then release the or like guess announce the Mac Pro and then release it towards the later end of the year. Yeah, I um, think that seems fair. Uh yeah. and so in this set of rumors, so that was the confirmation of the confirmation, but the r- new rumors are a new 16-inch MacBook Pro. So let's let's digest that one first. That would be most likely the current 15-inch MacBook Pro, but just with actual bezels that make sense for this time of computer sizes. Um, yeah. Those the bezels are insane bezel shrink. Right now. Yeah. Um, and, and that also means a new case design. Um, it almost certainly doesn't mean any new ports, but it could mean other things. So, you know, maybe they add a face ID kind of thing or they, you know, do something else different with it. But for, for certainly, it doesn't seem like they're going to add a new SKU to the lineup of how many SKUs already? Way too many. Dozen, Dozens. Dozens. There, there's yeah. seven SKUs. Exactly. Um, so how, 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 what do you think about a 16-inch model? Does that seem fun to you? Interesting? Uh, I like the idea of more screen real estate, but uh, I, I don't know that that would... I mean, that's certainly not going to sell me on a new MacBook when I just bought one in October. Yeah, no, probably not. You're not in the market right now. That's for sure. Yeah, I bought one in November. I I was like, you know, I should wait, but I I didn't. Well, and you can't always wait for the new thing; otherwise, you just keep waiting. Oh, yeah, uh, exactly. I think it's I think it's good. Um, I think one of the other questions that would come out of this is, will the keyboards be fixed? Um, even though no I, way. Even though I have not personally suffered a keyboard failure yet with the new MacBook Pro that I have from 2017, uh, one of these days some dog hair will get into it and it will be broken forever. Um, yeah. Honestly, the third generation isn't too bad. It's it's softer, less noisy. Uh, my work computer is the 2017, so it's the second generation. And my yep. personal one's the 2018, so third. And I think the the latest one is is much better. I wouldn't but. be surprised if they either go to a fourth or just give it a new name. The um, new new so keyboard. The new 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 keyboard. Each new is another number. Okay, so that's cool. New MacBook Pro. That's 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 a wonderful thing to have. I'm, I'm it's about time. Uh, next, a 31 inch 6K monitor. Huh. I guess that sounds interesting. I would buy it. I am totally in the market right now for a large, um, high DPI display. I've been eyeing the 27 inch 5K iMac for a while. And because it hasn't been updated in a year and a half, I've been waiting till Apple does something new with that or some other thing. And right. if they release a 31 inch 6K monitor, if it works with my current MacBook Pro, I'm totally, totally going to get that. Um, that sounds great. And if they make it an iMac, I would buy the iMac, you know, whatever. If you need a modern, modern computer, maybe I'd think about buying it in a Mac Mini. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So my question, and I and I have no idea because I don't know, understand how monitors and graphics work. So what can drive a 6K monitor? Can can a MacBook Pro drive that, or can, or do you need a special real graphics computer to do that? I think a MacBook Pro could, because it can drive two 4K displays. Okay. Which is, um, though actually wait, a 6K. I think two 4K and one 6K might be about the same number of pixels yeah right so i think current hardware could do that what becomes the problem is having enough bandwidth to drive that because that's so much over one cable mm-hmm. so i think they would absolutely need to be thunderbolt 3 um yeah. displays or is thunderbolt 4 around the corner i haven't heard anything about four so me either so I probably was, not or I maybe even not dual thunderbolt 3 and you splice uh, the 
splice the signals together because that the current be... 5K display is really two one point or display port 1.2 streams stitched together. Oh yeah. no! Because wow. otherwise you couldn't do it with enough bandwidth. Because right. it's not just 5K; it's a 10-bit 5K display, I believe. So there's more yeah. color data to push, and the display port 1.4 or 3 protocol doesn't support uh, that high resolution with that high color. So they do two lower resolution ones and stitch it together. Pretty wild. Yeah. I, so, okay, now we have to guess the price. $5,000. That's 19, what I was thinking. If it's, if it's just a monitor, probably nineteen ninety nine. Mm. What? Mm. That seems That seems unreal for 6K. Too much, you think? No, I think too little. Too I little? think it, it think it's got to be like twenty five hundred to three thousand. Well, I was minimum. thinking three thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's true. Jeez, if they make that, I really hope that uh, <laughs> it works with my MacBook. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. It is a lot. Um, the the reason I I wonder about the price there is because if they release it with the you know it, it also makes you wonder what's the price of the new Mac Pro like. At, at least at base model so like i'm thinking at least three thousand base model right um it doesn't look so expensive when it's paired with another expensive thing yeah. um yeah and and what was what was when apple did some monitors what was the price of the monitor back then 1999 12.99 something like that yeah you know it's been too long yeah that 30 30 inch cinema display i don't remember that was yeah. really before i remembered prices mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. things yeah, that was, that was when I was in junior high reading Wikipedia articles about Apple computers. Good right. times. Good yeah. times. Throwback. No, I think I think that'll be a fun product. I I do question how much it'll sell though. Yeah. If they made like a twenty seven inch like four K monitor and it was cut in half in price, I think they would sell quadruple the numbers. Totally. Isn't that like, just the, an iMac with target display mode? No, no, no. It's, it's but it's not an iMac. That's the that's the point. Uh, I don't believe in those, um, and I think a lot of people don't believe in those. Uh, and so that it's a market that Apple is f- failing to fulfill demand right. in. Um, okay, so there's still still more stuff here in this rumor packet. Um, this is a terrible way to phrase this. Nine to five Mac should be ashamed. iPhones with bilateral charging. So the phone can. Be charged and it can charge other things as well. That's what yeah, it means. Like AirPods, maybe even an Apple Watch, but probably oh. AirPods is the like big use case I could think of. Yeah, maybe this is my iPhone Seven talking, but in no circumstance would I ever want something to drain my <laughs> iPhone's battery faster than it already is. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I agree. I, I don't care if it's headphones or a watch. I would just rather have my phone work for a little while longer. Yeah, but oh, I don't no, know. Nope. Maybe there's like a little nuclear reactor in there that just powers it for days. Though, if it could charge my watch, and I like I hadn't charged my watch the night before, my phone was at fifty percent battery, and I was like twenty minutes away from midnight, and I still needed to do ten minutes of exercise, and my watch was at three percent. I would probably want to charge my watch a little bit. My yeah, favorite thing fair. about what you just said is it was a hypothetical with like six conditionals in front. <laughs> <laughs> that has happened before, and I've like. I've been frantic about making sure I could I could finish the day. I am right. so glad that I am not such a slave to my tech that I have no compulsion to fulfill that thing, whatever that is. I, <laughs> it's okay. it is, it's, it's okay. a niche thing. I will give you that. It, it is. Yeah, I I used to I used to be a completionist about that, and then I just let let go of it, and it I it was very. It was a positive, positive thing. Not that it's not that it's not positive to 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 chase that. It can definitely be positive, but for me, it was definitely positive to be okay if my watch doesn't meet its move goal every every day of every week. I don't make my exercise goal every day, but maybe all but one or two days a month I do. Maybe three nice. or four. Um, but my move goal, I'm at like a 450 day streak, so I'm trying to keep that up. Okay, that's amazing. Especially yeah, as time keeps going on, it's See, and like, your, there's your more and more goal, going for it. Your move goal is like double mine, if I remember correctly. Like, yeah, my, at, mine's like 380, and you're at like 660 something. I'm like at that, right? 500. Um, nice. I don't know. I when I so when I got my iPhone 10s Max this fall, I had to you know repair my watch to it. 
Yeah. And I swear something then it, it meant that, uh, more calories retract more easily for me. It nice. all of a sudden got more easy and like, like something was off in the software, you know, the calibration was off. It thought I was moving more or maybe my old one wasn't doing it correctly. So sure. That was about the time when I went from 400 to 500 and it really didn't impact my day to day at all. So I that's don't awesome. really know what the deal is there. No, that's fair. I I've kept mine at 380 for a while. I feel like because, uh, you know, when I was biking to work, it would be something that I would, you know, I could usually attain it pretty well as long as I was biking to work or running at least one time a day for a while. And then I started biking to work less <laughs> and I started missing it less or missing it more frequently. And now I basically don't bike to work ever because where is work? I don't know. Somewhere. Um, yeah. Everywhere. It's wherever work is. Yeah. Work is all around. Okay, no, but there's on. there's still more we have to talk about. Oh, the, sorry, the rumors continue. never end. Okay, so in addition to bilateral charging, which is meaningless, there will be an additional ultra wideband connectivity for indoor positioning and navigation. That's All what right. you've always wanted, right? That sounds there cool. W- there will be okay. a new higher powered flood illuminator so that face ID works better in theory. Okay. All right. Larger batteries in theory. Mm-hmm. So that it can spare some power to give to your other wireless devices. And a triple camera set up on the larger phone. Because that's those what you've always wanted. Always wanted that, right? Yeah. Yeah. A, tri- a triclops. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then and then we can't we can't end yet because finally the iPad lineup is going to change yet again. And this time, apparently, the nine point seven inch iPad will increase to the 10.2 inch iPad and there will be a new iPad mini apparently. I I just don't even know how many iPads are there now and what do they all mean? 37 and nothing. <laughs> okay then. I mean the the size increase makes sense. Smaller bezels make the smaller one seem more appealing compared to the Pros. And totally I agree. The mini is just because that current mini is so old. Oh, yeah, they want totally. they want to keep a mini around, but not. But there are so many yeah. models now. I don't even know. Yeah. Like I don't even know. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I remember just you know, half half a decade ago or something. There was. We call that five years where I'm from, by the way. What? We call five that years? five years ago from where I'm from. Half a decade. Okay, I guess I'm trying to whatever. That's fair. Half a decade is. <laughs> half a decade, fair. five years. Uh, five percent of a of a century yeah there we go yeah um yeah you could na- name off all the devices all of their size capacities and how much each single one cost because that was just there weren't that many yep. maybe i maybe it's because i followed more closely then too i don't know well i, I think it was easier to follow back then because there were yeah. fewer i did go i did just go to the all ipads page here on the website so there's an ipad mini 4 there's an ipad there's a 10.5 Pro, there's an 11 Pro, and there's a 12.9 Pro. Wow, there's a lot of Pros. Yeah, that's a lot. And I don't know how many... They all have probably different storage configurations, different colors. And, and they're like going to the, discontinue the 10.5 Pro, right? Yeah, that's the old one. Or, or a year and a half or two years ago's it's, model. It's the old one. Yeah. yeah. And so then they're going to make an iPad Mini 5 and an iPad, and they're going to have the new design... Oh my gosh, it's so confusing. But you know what's ridiculous right now? The the iPad that is not quite a year old is seventy dollars cheaper than the iPad Mini Four, which is smaller and way slower because it's several years older. Yep. Huh. Makes you wonder why what what happened there. Like, was demand not very strong, or was like what what like were they capitalizing on higher margins on the higher products? So let's work on those first. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, that is officially all of the rumors that I have access to at this moment. Nice. Call back next week for more. Sounds good. Yep. Well, that means it's uh, about time for us to talk through uh, our favorite recurring segment, our main recurring segment, and possibly our only recurring segment. Uh, new Twitter followees. Hooray! Uh, I'll start with uh, one that I just tracked down today. It's uh, 33 ASR which is a, uh, a physical teletype machine. Now, if you've interacted with a terminal uh, window at all, uh, you're like a like bash or something like that, uh, you might notice it's in a weird like 
a grayscale window that has characters on it. When you hit enter, you type a command and hit enter, it reads stuff back to you. Um, that's basically using the same protocol that's in use on that physical teletype machine there. Um, and somebody has one of these and they've wired it up to do some fun stuff. So they tweeted uh, recently about um, doing Git operations from this teletype ma- machine. And it's really kind of cool. Uh, it's a neat little hardware hacking project that uh, all the documents for it are on GitHub and stuff. So it's uh, worth checking out. Cool. What's cool about it is seeing, you know, the, what a lot of terminals do where you have a line that is continuously updating as something is going on. So like this percent done, this percent done. What, you know, what it actually does is it, it writes to a line, but with no new line feed yep. and then just replaces the line. But when it's this, uh, t- teletype typewriter it's just writing over the current line over and over so it, gets, it has no notion of anything else yeah, yeah it gets thicker and bolder and then the percentages just become black squares because it's just every number on top All of each numbers. other and that's just really cool to see because it's it's super clearly showing what a terminal really is yep pretty fancy uh, the next one is Increment Mag, which is a, something I hadn't heard of before recently, but I think Dan Abramov has something in there. Uh, it seems to be kind of a cool thing about, like, uh, you know, clearly I guess it has a React e JavaScript event in some ways, uh, kind of publications around uh, this kind of ecosystem springing up. So I, I thought that was kind of cool and worth looking into. And then, uh, let's see, last but not least is uh, LKG Glass, or Looking Glass, which is a hardware product uh, that has this, like, awesome holographic display um, where you can uh, kind of see a 3D object, like a .obj file or an FBX file or something like that, um, and interact with it in the real world. It's kind of a wild little hybrid, you know... AR sort of thing that's not really like mobile AR, like the sort of AR you use like AR and AR kit and AR car for. But um, it's pretty cool looking. They're kind of pricey, otherwise I'd get one. But they're pretty fancy. People have done some cool. really cool stuff with it too. So yeah, it's pretty cool. To, cool to see in a video or a video of it in action. Yeah. How about you, Brian? Well, I'm I'm pulling up mine, and I realized, Brandon, you already follow all of these people and you've probably talked about them all before too but i don't keep track of that it's all Um, good so the first person i followed is devon Lindsay. she's the senior front-end engineer at apple and i thought i should follow some like web people at apple that sounds like a fun niche that i don't have in my twitter feed so using web objects since 1991 oh heck yeah doesn't that run on java uh no was it i thought it was objective c Oh, you might be right about that. I swear it was some Java acquisition back when Apple was pushing Java, like as part of like Mac OS X was it runs Java, Java two Uh, days or something. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I need to see more what she's put out, but, um, yeah, looks like a cool thing there. Uh, next up is, uh, let me figure out how to pronounce his name. Mark, uh, Del... Glish. Glish. Yeah. Um, someone retweeted him about like joke JavaScript tweets. That might have been me. Was it you? <laughs> it I don't could know. very well have been me. I do love my joke JavaScript tweets. So I gave him a follow. And um, yeah, there's some good stuff. Um, there, what, what was. Uh, he had something that was tweeted that I saw that was. You know, like there's the classic uh, SpongeBob. Or Patrick Star type inference one that I've seen over the lot over the last couple of years. Jeez, these are all just JavaScript memes. It's great. Yeah, there's a good one earlier about uh I'm trying to remember what it was. It was like uh somebody saying that uh JavaScript has too many dependencies and then uh he removed node modules and uh get ignored package JSON and saw how they liked it then. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, try- yep. I'm trying to find that. That was one, from that like was... yesterday, I think. Or... Yeah, I think, I think it works really well when you do that. <laughs> yep. The one that I saw that I think was retweeted around when I um, followed him. Actually, it was Ken C. Dodds who t- tweeted this. This was on February 12th when I followed him. All right. Mark said, if you're not mocking at Lodash, can you really call it a unit test? Uh, yeah, that was a good one too. 
so yeah, I'm excited to follow him. And then finally, um, Sebastian McKenzie, who is a JavaScripter at Facebook. He's uh, I listened to the first episode of the Undefined podcast. Uh, thank you to Ryan who linked me to that. Nice. Um, and he's talking about uh, some tooling that he's worked on. And yeah, he seems like a pretty cool guy to follow as well. I'm I'm did I do that? You talked about it. You posted it in Slack somewhere, and so I yeah. gave it a listen, and now I'm subscribed. Cool. I didn't even know that I did that. <laughs> Pretty fancy. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, that's that's impressive. That's who I followed. I, uh, you know, I actually followed some people this time. It's hey. very rare, so uh, we should savor the moment. So the first one here is Kate, or Katie Cool. Kate, yeah, um, Kate Cool. She uh, went to the U of M and uh, very recently was on one of the winning teams from Minihack. Um, so that was pretty cool. Oh, for um, real? Yeah. I didn't realize. Oh, Kate and I, like, we ran a student group together at the U a while back. Well, look at that. See, it's a small yeah. world. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we talked for a little bit and that was pretty fun. Um, she's she's great. So that's pretty good. And then I also follow here Daniel O'Connor. um who does something. I don't know how I found this person, but I think they followed me first. Um, and they, 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 they tweet about tech stuff about MDX and other things that I like, like hooks. Nice. So that's always, always good to see. Everybody likes those things. Truly. Yeah. There you go. You I get can say two hooks people, are great. Two people that I can follow. Hey, that's uh, it's more that's, than usual. That's infinitely more than last time. Yeah, that is true, but it's still like, 0.2% of what Brandon does. Well, Brandon isn't human, so whatever. <laughs> uh, this is true. Yeah. Well, uh, next time, uh, I, between now and next episode, I'm going to be preparing for my uh, uh, Open Source North talk. Nice. Um, so that should be fun. We'll you, talk should, about... uh, you should tell everybody when that is. Yes. Uh, Open Source North, it's, it is it is an event, and it takes place at May 22nd. Thanks, Brian. Uh, <laughs> takes place at Normandale Community College in beautiful, historic Bloomington, Minnesota. Um, Richfield, Bloomington, Bloomington, Normandale. Richfield. It, it's in Normandale. It's in. Oh, really? That's a city. I didn't realize that. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, That's what I call it. But I wouldn't put it past it to be a city. Um, yeah, but it'll be in May, so I guess I have longer to prepare. So that's good. So I should, but I should still start preparing now because there's some stuff to do. I have a rough outline and I have some slides and I've, you know, got some stuff set up. But I have eighty percent of it that I need to figure out. Look, your fun. your name is on the list. I know it's it's that's, alarming. That's pretty cool. It's kind of a problem, but I'm no, excited for it. no, it's a problem in a good way. It it pretty absolutely cool. is a problem in a good way. I'm very excited that yeah. I have to project nervousness because that's that's who i am that's that's what you do i see yep i'm, I'm really excited that it should be fun excellent uh how about you guys what's what else is new um i'm going skiing in salt lake city in the first weekend of march that'll be pretty nice. fun nice. first time skiing in the mountains in many many years uh you know i bet there will be some snow there i certainly hope so there was like 110 inches or more like a week ago as their base so far so yeah i think you might be okay i'm i'm pretty happy Sounds with good. that oh my gosh i cannot imagine 110 inches of snow that's awful you should go uh hang out with kcd while you're in uh <laughs> slc that would be that would be quite something i don't have anything planned on that monday so there, there you, you go, go. Now, <laughs> now you know what to do just go visit a javascript and uh he'll be there yep <laughs> yeah shout out a mountain i would like to test some components and he'll he'll meet he'll meet you Skiing he'll just he'll alpaca. just appear in front of me he'll just exactly. ski right up to you yeah exactly <laughs> that's how he gets everywhere That'd be uh, great. I, i'm pretty sure that's like public transportation in in utah right it's, yeah it it's is skiing yeah in winter at least lift. yeah right um yeah, I don't know if I'm doing anything particularly special in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I would look at my calendar, but that's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, so we're just going to pretend that I'm not. I'm going to turn – are you ready for this great time thing? I'm going to turn two and a half decades old uh, oh, next week. So that's nice. a thing. Happy birthday. Congrats. Yeah. There's nothing really to it. It's another year. <laughs> now I'm the same age we as Ryan. We call 25 where I'm from. <laughs> that's a quarter century. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's good though. Very good. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, where can we find you guys on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, Brian M dot me where I post, uh, articles to things. And well, maybe not, maybe I write blogs. I wrote an, I wrote a post for my, uh, work engineering blog, which I will link in the show notes. It's about Jekyll, oh, yeah. which is everyone's favorite, uh, static site generator. Yeah. Every time, every time you post or I get a post from that source, uh, I share it to all, all the people at work and they're like, that's cool. So good work. What? Yeah, e- truly. Every, every post that is on there. Yeah. Ooh, that's cool. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Well, and of course you could find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at random art. And of course on my website, which is running com. except you cannot find me on Facebook because it's evil. So, uh, we should all use react. That's true. Yay. Uh, we can find me, uh, mostly Roman Graham, Minneapolis. Uh, but on the internet, I basically just tweet now. Uh, so, uh, my Twitter is Brandon underscore MN where I'll talk about things like, uh, how I read 2001, a space odyssey this weekend. And that was nice. I saw that. That was fun. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't realize it was a book. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really kind of cool. Um, the book was actually written in tandem with the movie script. Um, mm. So there's some interesting stuff that happens there. So cool. highly recommend it. Cool. Well, um, you can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash PK46. You can also uh, discuss what we have talked about in this episode on our Reddit, which is uh, reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv and if you like what we're doing swing on over to our patreon which is patreon.com slash the nexus tv and you can uh give us some tips there and get exclusive month or not not month delayed access to our fringe episodes exclusive and you can even watch ian our book edit some episodes of something nice Ooh, he's, yeah. he's he's live streaming right now as we record this I would also just like to uh, plug our new show um, in boot camp, which Ryan Aww. and Matt are working on. It's super fun it to hear really about. Um, yeah, it's it's really good. It's really fun to hear about Matt and his thoughts uh, learning about like software de- development at a boot camp. And I'm so excited every week to listen to the next episode. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an insider sneak peek. Um, so I we, we are actually delayed a few weeks in real time from what, what is being released. So we just released episode two of In Boot Camp. Episode three, four, and five are already done and completed and edited and ready to go at any time. Um, and so Matt is at basically just past the one month mark here. And he's having a lot of fun with it. He's really enjoying it. And, um, you know, pretty soon he's going to start working on some of his resume stuff and start, um, you know, thinking about how to approach employers and you know start start even taking the next step after learning stuff which is to use the stuff that you've learned so that's that's pretty cool a lot of fun yeah and we'll have that linked in the show notes as well so you can check it out pretty cool well with that i think we are set and have a good one have a good one have a good one YouTube's just like, this dude loves planes, man. We're just gonna give him all the plane videos. More planes. Ryan can't get enough of planes. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. Convergence.